Great. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. My name is Bryant Jackson Green. I'm the criminal justice policy analyst with the Illinois Policy Institute. Uh, and welcome to Realizing Reform. We're going to be talking tonight about um, solutions to fix Illinois' criminal justice system. Uh, and we brought together a great panel that I think you'll enjoy tonight. I want to start off by thanking the Hoagland Center for having us here in this space. Uh, and then thanking our partners, the Charles Koch Institute, who were kind enough to help support us and bring this conversation to Springfield. Uh, I'm actually an alum of one of their programs, Liberty at Work, which you can find out about at the front desk. Uh, but they do um, great activism and great training programs and have actually had similar events like this one in Atlanta, in um, Virginia, just sort of highlighting the need for criminal justice reform and why everyone uh, across the political spectrum has a stake in the issue and why they all need to be at the table. So some of you might be wondering, why is the Illinois Policy Institute doing this? Uh, if you've heard about us, we started in 2002. We were a small government, uh, fiscal, uh, we encouraged small government, fiscal responsibility, uh, low taxes. You might know of our work on pension reform uh, and, and um, tax issues. Uh, but why do we get started in doing criminal justice? Well, the fact is that Illinois' prison population has increased by over 330% since the late 80s. The Department of Corrections budget has continued to rise uh, during this time and is now at $1.3 billion a year. Uh, per inmate, would you include uh, health care, pensions, and administration, um, Illinois actually pays a lot more than its neighbors, $38,000 per person we have uh, right now in the Department of Corrections. And the most, one of the most shocking facts is that almost 50%, 45% to be exact, of people who are in our prison system return within five years. We find this state of things to be unacceptable. And we think that the same principles that encourage us to support limited government and fiscal responsibility should also be applied to the criminal justice system as well. So that's why we began um, about three months ago now uh, involving ourselves in this issue. Uh, we're here to, um, to support and encourage the goals of uh, a new commission that was announced by uh, Governor Rauner uh, in February that seeks to reduce the state's prison population by 25% over the next 10 years. There are a lot of things that have to be looked at, sensing reform, reentry policy, figuring out how do we keep nonviolent offenders especially um, out of prison? How do we reform them and make sure that you know, even if they make a mistake, they don't end up back in the same place they were three, um, three years ahead of now? To help highlight uh, some of these goals that the Commission's been working on, we were fortunate to have Samantha Gaddy, who uh, works as a policy advisor for public safety for the Office of the Governor. She's going to talk for about uh, 10 minutes about the initiatives the committee's proposed and how their progress is going towards um, bringing solutions to the fore about how to reduce, safely reduce our prison population and also continue the decline in crime in Illinois that's been going on for the past couple decades. Samantha Gaddy uh, was formerly a senior policy advisor with the Illinois Sentencing Policy Advisory Council. Uh, where she advised policymakers on the system-wide fiscal impact of sentencing policy and procedures. Prior to that, she worked as a member of the Attorney General's legislative team, where she advocated in areas like public safety, uh, crime victim rights, witness rights, and lending reform. She also worked for the uh, uh, Illinois Innocence Project, where she helped investigate post-conviction claims of innocence, and currently serves on the Council of the Juvenile Justice Leadership, um, and as part of the Alpha Phi Sigma, a National Criminal Justice Honor Society. Please join me in welcoming Samantha Gaddy. Make sure this is at the right one. First, I'd start, uh, like to start by thanking the Illinois Policy Institute uh, for inviting me to speak tonight, as well as the Charles Koch Institute, the Shriver Center, um, Families Against Mandatory Minimums, and the Justice Fellowship for participating in tonight's panel. Criminal justice reform is a bipartisan issue. I think it's some, something that both sides of the aisle can get around, and um, we can work together on how to best address the challenges that we're facing and that our state can, can work together to address. With 48,000 inmates, nearly 48,000, we're just a little bit below that today, inmates in the prison system here in Illinois, we're operating at almost 150% capacity uh, of what we were built for. We're built for between 32 and 33,000 inmates. Um, 
it's unsafe. The levels are unsafe for both prisoners who the state is charged with caring for and our, our officers and, and guards that we have there who oftentimes find themselves understaffed um, and, and just dealing with this huge population crisis that we have. So as the rate of property crimes and violent crimes has fallen throughout the state over the years, we've seen such a huge, huge rise in, in the population. Since its inception, the inception of the, the Department of Corrections in the state, we've risen 600%. I know Bryant said 350% since the 80s, but overall about 600% in population. Um, it's an enormous cost to taxpayers, and that's of huge concern to our governor as you know, he deals with the budget and the fiscal crisis that we have in the state right now. So as Brian alluded to, taxpayers in Illinois, as you've heard probably many times, are paying about $1.3 billion on the Department of Corrections each year and nearly $130 million on the Department of Juvenile Justice every year. And despite these extraordinary expenditures, 48% of our population is seeing themselves come back, seeing themselves come back in three years. Bryant talked about 45% in five years, but in three years it's 48%. And who knows what the number is if we um, go a little bit shorter in a time period. Um, we know that mandatory minimums, length of stay, and truth in sentencing have helped cause these issues um, of ex super expensive system. I mean, prison is our most expensive form of punishment for both adults and juveniles. Um, it's driving up the time that offenders are staying in prison, but also the cost to the state um, and, and cost to taxpayers. So the governor understands that our prison system, and our justice system in Illinois in general, is in trouble. Um, he's very committed to working on these issues from jail, <laughs> from, pre, from arrest through jail, through diversion, sentencing, um, the Department of Corrections and successful reentry into the community. And that's one of his biggest issues is that we have our citizens successfully returning and reintegrating into the community so that they can become productive citizens like the rest of us. He's a big proponent of second chances and he talks about that all the time. So an early visit to Logan Correctional Center, um, I went, the governor went, a few other staff members went, um, just sort of, um, reaffirmed the belief that we really need to work quickly and boldly to address these issues. Um, the governor was appalled by what he saw at um, Logan and he wanted reform quickly. So as you know, early in the administration, or many of you probably know, the governor signed Executive Order 1514, which established the Illinois State Commission on Criminal Justice and Sentencing Reform. And this focus, focuses on our adult population only, not juveniles, just adults. Our juvenile system is actually doing very well. We're at um, the lowest population that we've had since 2006 when the Department of Juvenile Justice broke off from the Department of Corrections. We have uh, right around 700, it kind of waxes and wanes between 650 and 700 um, juveniles in secure care custody every day. And we uh, fully expect that we'll, uh, decrease that population as uh, time goes on and new legislation and reforms are passed. So um, we're really excited about the progress and the growth uh, with our juvenile justice system. But with our adult system and with the commission that the governor created, um, he knows that the Constitution in Illinois says that when we're taking the step of imposing a loss of freedom on one of our citizens, that we must um, the penalties must be determined both in accordance with the seriousness of the offense, but the most important part is returning offenders with the objective of returning offenders to useful citizenship once they leave the Department of Corrections. So we have a lot to do, a lot of work to do in that area of being able to allow offenders to have second chances and to reintegrate into society. We have a solemn responsibility to conduct comprehensive review of the state's systems, what it needs, um, what, what we're doing that's wasting taxpayers' money, 
what we can help to do to allow these offenders to be actually corrected while they're in the Department of Corrections um, and, and be able to move move forward um, and become productive when they when they get out and reduce victimizations that's the important part right so that we fix them so that when they they leave we aren't having victims more victims all the time so one of the things that we'd like to look more at is uh, community supervision we have programs in our state like adult redeploy which in its three years um, three years since its inception has reduced um, or at least has diverted about 2,000 offenders from the Department of Corrections kept them in the community and helped to work intensely with them so that they hopefully do not one day go to the Department of Corrections. Governor Rahner, for our commission, going back to that, has asked the commission to look at ways that they can safely, and that's the important part, safely reduce the population of the Department of Corrections by about 25% in 10 years. So, so far the commission is exploring, questioning, and evaluating the system that we have, is looking at what other states have done, mm, programs that we have in our local jurisdictions. There's a lot of good stuff going on um, on the local level that possibly we could implement on a statewide level. Um, so we're looking at a bunch of stuff, using evidence-based research and analysis um, to come up with ways that will help us safely reduce the population by 25%. So we're also gonna look at county jail populations, um, including the relationship between pretrial detention and the likelihood that an offender will be sentenced to the Department of Corrections one day. So these are just small um, snippets of some of the things that we're finding out throughout the commission. So, and critically important to the commission is that we'll address the infrastructure and sustained leadership necessary to ensure lasting change once the commission gives its recommendations. So, as we started doing some research and going back here and with other people like the Sentencing Policy Advisory Council and the Criminal Justice Information Authority, we started seeing that this isn't the first commission that a governor has created. We've seen commissions from uh, Governor Edgar, Governor Thompson, governors from back in the 70s, they've created a commission to address prison reform or um, sentencing reform because they've known for years that the population was rising and that we needed to do something. We were gonna be in trouble eventually. And we've seen that every decade that the population has risen. And a lot of times recommendations were implemented or recommendations were given, but they weren't necessarily implemented. So we'd like to put some mechanisms in place, and that's still under discussion. We're not sure what exactly those will be, but that will allow the leadership to sustain <laughs> what the recommendations are over the years. So we don't come back in 20 years with a new governor, four or five governors from now saying, I'm gonna create a commission to do this, um, and, and look back and see that Governor Rahner's commission didn't do what uh, he intended to do. So I just want to reiterate that the governor is very passionate about criminal justice and sentencing reform. Um, it's at the top of his agenda. It's one of his top priorities. If you've ever heard him speak about it, you'll see and hear the passion in his voice when he speaks about it. It's a huge priority of this administration, but it's also, let me be clear, it's also a huge priority that we protect public safety by incapacitating the right individuals, and that's the key, incapacitating the right individuals, the people that really need to be there, but also providing the structured support and evidence-based practices and programming that they need so that they will not come out and recidivate and create um, future victimizations. But we also know that there's a, a good amount of the population that maybe <coughs> doesn't need to be there or that can be uh, treated in the community at a much cheaper cost. So um, we're going to press forward and we look forward to working with all of you. Um, invite you to come to any of the commission meetings. We have a website. You can contact me. Um, our chairman of the commission is in the audience somewhere, Roger Heaton. Um, you can co contact me or him. Um, we're happy to give you some information on how you can come to one of the meetings. Um, we, we have time at the end of each of the meetings for public comment, public testimony. Um, we'd like to hear from, from you guys as well on uh, what you think is uh, needing to be addressed in our, in our prison system. So I thank you for having me here today and uh, thank you for your support as we go on this journey together.
and now our moderator for Current Ready, who is a senior fellow at the Charles Koch Institute. Hello, thank you. Uh, all of you so much for joining us today. My name is Vikrant Reddy. I'm a senior research fellow with the Charles Koch Institute. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I'm going to take a minute to talk about the Charles Koch Institute and why we are interested in this issue. We've uh, been working on it for quite a while, and I think it, it comes down to uh, the, the passion that the people at the Charles Koch Institute uh, and that our board have for this issue can be encapsulated uh, in three uh, basic ways. The first is um, that we see this as a matter of public safety. We see this as an issue, secondly, of human dignity. And third, we see it as an issue of, of costs. We'll go over those just uh, one by one. First of all, just in terms of public safety, I think there's a sense that, well, you know, safety just means uh, you lock people away and then we're safe, right? And that, that's a little short-sighted because most of the people that get locked up are eventually going to come out and live next door to you and me. I think serious questions need to be asked about what to do to keep down recidivism rates and make sure that they're putting their lives back together and not hurting us when they come out. And there is a real case to be made that incarceration, at a certain level, when it's, uh, the periods of incarceration are so lengthy uh, and so harsh that um, it actually becomes criminogenic, which is this fancy word criminologists use that mean means it's causing more crime than it's stopping. I think it's worth thinking about that. I think secondly, just as a matter of human dignity, there's something really terrifying about seeing so many of our, our fellow men locked up in these cages. Uh, there's so much human potential that's wasted like that. And then I think thirdly, uh, it's an issue of cost. We've heard uh, both of our previous speakers talking about how profoundly expensive it is to uh, incarcerate somebody rather than have them uh, on a good community supervision program. And uh, I just don't think that that's something that, that we can afford as Americans. I know it's something that we can't afford here in Illinois. So we've been focused on these issues all over the country. We're going to different states. Last week we were in Ohio. We did a panel where we talked about these issues. Uh, we recently were in Georgia. We know we've done an event in Texas. We're in Illinois today and it's I'm especially excited to be in Illinois. Illinois strikes me as kind of a unique case because from everything I, I read and hear about, the political culture in Illinois suggests it would be the type of place that's really, really open to criminal justice reform. And yet the politics of Illinois don't seem to be reflecting what is in the political culture. And I, that's really confusing to me. And I'm looking forward to having a neat dialogue tonight and talking with all of you in the audience during our Q&A and trying to figure out what we can do to move the ball forward in Illinois, because I think if we figure out what the problem is here, we'll actually get a good sense of, of what the problem is in places like California and a lot of other uh, very large states, important states across the country. So that's enough from me. I want to turn to our panelists who uh, are absolutely fantastic. Several of them are personal friends of mine. Really excited to be introducing them tonight. I'm going to introduce everybody one by one. We will start with Jesse Weiss right here, who is a policy analyst with Justice Fellowship. Uh, Jesse joined Justice Fellowship in 2012. He contributes to adult criminal justice reforms in states, and he helps to develop policy and legislation that reflect the principles of restorative justice. In January of 2000, Jesse received a 15-year prison sentence. During his incarceration, he completed his undergraduate degree with honors from the Moody Bible Institute. After Jesse's release, Prison Fellowship hired him as a re-entry specialist. In that role, Jesse established community support groups coordinated with the Iowa Department of Corrections to recommend treatment alternatives, and developed mentor training programs. Jesse graduated magna cum laude from Regent University School of Law. Well, I think you're talking about me. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's good to be with everyone this evening. It's good to be in Illinois, in the land of Lincoln. Um, my name is Jesse Weiss. I do represent Justice Fellowship, which is the Public Policy Advocacy Division of Prison Fellowship Ministries, which was started about 40 years ago by the late Charles Colson. And so for those of you who are old enough in this room, I think we remember uh, Watergate and uh, Chuck Colson as he um, went to federal prison for uh, Watergate-related crimes. And as he was in, in federal prison, he told the men there, I will never forget you. And as he walked out and uh, the door closed on him, uh, for the last time. He didn't forget those men. 
um, in that prison that he spent time with. And as a result of that, he founded Prison Fellowship. But it was, it was soon after that he realized that we can't just visit people in prison, that we actually need to reform the criminal justice system. And that was um, in 1983, he founded Justice Fellowship. And since then, we've been working in these trenches, um, trying to get conservatives and liberals alike um, to really understand um, the need um, for justice reform in the United States. And I thought I would just kind of take a brief moment and just kind of uh, paint a national landscape. Um, I know we're going to get into some Illinois specifics here. Um, but currently in the United States, there's about 2.3 million people who are incarcerated. There's about 7 million um, adults in the criminal justice system who are either on probation, uh, parole, or who are incarcerated. That's roughly about 1 in 34 adults. Um, on the back side of criminal justice, there are about 65 million, at least 65 million adults with some form of criminal record. That's one out of every four adults in the United States, or 25%. We have roughly, we make roughly about 11 million arrests a year. Um, and so if you calculate that back for 20 years, you can kind of see where the 65 million number uh, may be legitimate. Um, and so I'm going to let uh, other panelists here um, talk about some of the costs associated with criminal justice. And I, I really wanted to talk about the human element of criminal justice. I really believe that criminal justice is about people first, people second, and people third. And I think we can say it's about people, it's about communities. It's about people, it's about people's, people who are victims of crime. And it's about people who are actually in the criminal justice system or those who are responsible and, and, and who need to be held accountable. Um, you know, as Vikrant mentioned, I spent about seven and a half years in the Iowa prison system. And one of the things that I, I took out as I walked out from there is, number one, is our criminal justice system, the, the norms that exist in our criminal justice system within our prisons are antithetical to the norms uh, in, in, in society. And what I mean by that is if we practice the norms that people are allowed to live by in prison, on the outside of those walls, people are just going to end right back up into prison. And when we talk about criminal justice reform, we have a lot of, we, we spend a lot of time talking about front end reforms, which means sentencing reform. You know, there's only really three ways that you can, uh, or two ways really that, that, that you can um, change uh, criminal justice reform in a state. And that is either you stop the amount of people going into prison or you increase the number of people going out the back door. But one of the things that I feel like we don't give enough credence to is what actually happens inside of our prisons. What are we spending billions of dollars on rehabilitation um, with these individuals in our prison system, but then when they walk out, we're not allowing them to actually put those skills into practice. And, um, you know, at Justice Fellowship, our primary objective is to really to change the narrative of criminal justice in the United States, to change how we view the criminal justice system, its responsibility, because at the, at the end of the day, criminal justice is about how much power we give to government. And when we think about criminal justice, we think about we are giving government the most powerful um, use of its power. That, is, that doesn't make any sense. But we are, we are giving um, the government an incredible um, amount of power by taking away life and liberty. But yet, sometimes we have a tendency of thinking that so the bigger that is, the better it is for me. But that's not true. As we have seen just recently, you know, we, we, we're crying about privacy concerns with government. Anytime the government grows, our liberties shrink. And, this, and, and, the, and the same is uh, true within the criminal justice system. And so I really think we need to start looking at, um, particularly with limited government principles and applying them to the criminal justice system, but balancing that with public safety. We all want to, we all want to be safe, but at what cost? And I think if we look at trends across the country today where you see states like Texas that have closed three prisons, but yet the uh, crime rate has actually dropped as well. Um, so I, I, there are some really good examples to look at across the country. And I think I'll stop there, Bikrant, and, and pass it along. So. Okay, great, thanks, Jesse. No, I, I, thought, um, I thought what you said about uh, you know, limited government principles being such a big part of this is so important. Uh, so many of my conservative friends you know, when it comes to education and health care and so many different components of, of right. budgets, I mean, they, they look at every single nickel 
and yet when it comes to criminal justice, it's kind of just got a blank check to the government. And I, I never saw how that was philosophically consistent. Right. I think you're absolutely right. We'll turn to Greg Newburn now, uh, who is the State Policy Director for Families Against Mandatory Minimums. Um, and you have been at FAM since October of 2010. Prior to joining FAM, Greg worked at the Cato Institute and he taught high school, uh, economics, and government. Greg's a graduate of the University of Florida, the University of Florida College of Law. He lives in Gainesville. I follow him on Twitter, so I can tell you he has an unhealthy obsession with that college football team. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and we're happy to have him here today, Greg Newman. Thank you, Vikram, and uh, thank you to Illinois Policy Institute and Charles Koch Institute for having me here. It's, uh, it's an honor, and I'm fortunate enough to have been involved in another one of these panels down in Tallahassee, and it's great to see that, that these events are taking place all over the country because they're tremendously important to raise awareness of these, uh, these very important and weighty issues that are too often ignored in public policy debates. So thank you for, uh, for having me. Uh, like Vikrant said, I'm the State Policy Director for Families Against Mandatory Minimums. FAM is a national nonprofit group. It's based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we've been around since 1991 when our uh, president and uh, our current president, our founder, Julie Stewart, left the Cato Institute to start FAM. Her brother was uh, arrested and, and convicted for growing marijuana in Washington State. He was a first time offender. He and a couple of buddies grew some marijuana in their basement. Uh, and one of them was dumb enough to tell a neighbor about it. The neighbor called the police and they all got busted. Uh, his, his partners in crime, as it were, uh, flipped on a few other people. They got light sentences. Julie's brother did not. Uh, and he got five years in federal prison for uh, <coughs> the mandatory minimum marijuana law. Julie was working at Cato at the time and had no idea of, about what a mandatory minimum was. But uh, research, she thought he was going to get a slap on the wrist. You know, good kid, good education, good family, no criminal history, and it's marijuana, no victim, no violence. And, uh, you'll get a slap on the wrist, maybe probation, you know, don't be stupid anymore. Uh, but instead, he got five years in federal prison, and, and he had to serve that sentence. Uh, she was so appalled by that that she left the Cato Institute and started Families Against Mandatory Minimums. And she, she created the name Families Against Mandatory Minimums, but it's right there in the title. Everything we are about is right. It's, we make no mystery. Uh, we're against mandatory minimums. But she found so many other people who were in a similar position, whose their loved ones had had to go away to federal, mostly federal at the time, for these prison sentences, for unreasonable prison sentences for comparatively light criminal behavior that didn't fit the crime. She found so many of these people, uh, they, they created this network of, of support for one another uh, that later evolved into a public policy advocacy organization, which is where we are now. Uh, a lot of our work is at the federal level. We've worked, uh, had tremendous success all throughout the time that we've, we've been uh, fighting mandatory minimums at the federal level, created a safety valve that has allowed something like 80,000 prisoners who would have gone to prison for mandatory minimums to avoid those lengthy prison sentences and add alternatives uh, to their prison sentences. And now we do a lot of work at the state level as well, and we see these, these issues becoming very hot at the state level now. Uh, we, just a couple of weeks ago in Oklahoma, they, they passed a safety valve, the governor signed there, that will allow low-level drug offenders to be diverted away from prison and into alternative sanctions, community control. We've seen similar reforms in Georgia. We've seen them in South Carolina, my home state of Florida. We passed a couple of safety valves last year. Uh, so you see states across the country are embracing these kinds of reforms. Now, some states are behind, and they still, it's like whack-a-mole. I, I open up the Internet every day, and, oh, look who filed another gun bill somewhere that now I've got to spend time fighting. Uh, so not every state is on board with, with reform yet, but it's certainly better, I think, now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. And a lot of that is because the evidence is overwhelming that mandatory minimums just simply don't do the things that, they, that we were all promised they would do when they were passed. We've got 40 years of data now, and it's all the same. They don't work. They're expensive. They're inefficient. They're counterproductive, et cetera. It all leads to the same conclusion and when the data are so overwhelming, it's almost impossible not to come to that conclusion. You can't look at this issue and come to a different conclusion. You can't study it. You can follow your gut instinct and you can say, oh, I know I'm right about this, but you can't look at the evidence. You can't look at the data and come to any other conclusion than these things don't make any sense. They don't do what th that we were promised to do. They don't deter crime. They're inefficient, they're inexpensive, et cetera. And so what we see at the state level is the 300% increase in corrections budgets from the states that have that, you know, it's just 
everyone passing these mandatory minimums. There's a new crime, they have a press conference, they pass a mandatory minimum. And they, uh, they were tough on crime, and they ratchet up the sentences over and over again. And so for 20, 30 years, you get the same pattern. New crime, press conference, new mandatory minimum, it never leaves. Meanwhile, you're, thousands of people are going into the prison system, billions of dollars that you never intended that you'd have to spend. And by, uh, they thought it was going to deter it, right? They didn't expect the prison population to increase because the entire theory was that people would be deterred by the sentences, and therefore they wouldn't commit the crime. It's the opposite. You don't see the deterrence, and the prison populations have skyrocketed, and along with it, the corrections budgets. And we talk a lot about the cost, and we talk about uh, taxpayers can't afford this, but when I taught high school economics, the first day I put T-A-N-S-T-A-A-F-L on the board, Milton Friedman. There ain't no such thing as a free lunch, right? If you spend something in one area, you by definition can't spend it in another. Every dollar you spend on inefficient incarceration, not incarceration necessarily, but inefficient incarceration, for a person who doesn't need to be there when he's there, is a dollar you can't spend on some more effective crime fighting tool. So it is, in a, in a very narrow sense, in, a, in the most meaningful sense possible, the money you spend on incarceration that you don't need to spend on incarceration increases the crime rate. This is not hyperbolic. This is, this is by definition true. If you incarcerate someone who doesn't need to be there and you're spending money to do that, you're not putting more police on the street. You're not putting uh, by, you know, uh, vests on police who are out there fighting on the front lines. You're not doing the things that can actually decrease victimhood and decrease crime. So what we say is, let's take a broad look at this. Oh, and in incidentally, I'm very happy to see that the commission here <coughs> includes sentencing reform in the title of the, of the commission. Because states across the country that create these commissions, they always leave that part out. They want to reduce the prison population, but they don't want to do the thing you have to do to reduce your prison population, which is look at your sentencing laws. Take a very long look at your sentencing laws and change them to make them more rational and fair, uh, and, and obviously cheaper, while protecting public safety. So I'm happy to see that. And before I, I go on too long, the, the idea here is uh, if you want to make true reforms to your state criminal justice system, Mandatory minimum reform and sentencing reform is a necessary component. It's not sufficient, but it's a necessary component. You can't do the things you want to do without taking a look at that. So I commend Illinois for, for doing that, and hopefully we can talk a little bit more about Illinois and what other states are doing as well. So thanks again for having me. Thanks, Greg. I'm, I'm also really encouraged by, um, by the governor's uh, apparent focus on sentencing reform, which is the front end reform as opposed to just the back end reform. When you work in this field, you find that, that people can be very enthusiastic about the back end reforms. Okay, well, let's help people reintegrate and get back into society. Let's do what we can. Then you say, okay, well, let's also look at the front end and think about whether or not they need to be spending that much time there in the first place. And then people tend to shy away. This, this state uh, in recent years uh, seems to be showing real leadership in that area. I'm, I'm also encouraged. So our next speaker is going to be David Kamek. Yes who is a senior fellow at the Illinois Policy Institute. David is a member of the Illinois and New York State Bars. He represents clients in criminal trials in Illinois state and federal courts. He's currently an adjunct faculty member in criminal and constitutional law at Aurora University. Kamek previously chaired the Kane County Bar Association's Criminal Practice Committee for more than five years, and he continued to be an active member. David's the author of the journal article, Rights of Pretrial Detainees in Illinois. I was also given a bio point here, David, that says that you may hold the record for one of the shortest jury acquittals in all of Illinois at only seven minutes, which uh, is mind-boggling to me. That's very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> David Kamek. Uh, obviously, the facts were on my side. Uh, <laughs> personally, I'm gratified to see members of, of the Illinois legislature here. And as I sat down and met, met, got to know these gentlemen a little more than I haven't met before, I was just impressed by... by how much they believe in the cause and how much they see the reform. But if you had asked me before this panel that, that someone would be telling me Texas is in somehow on the vanguard of sentencing reform, I'd have said, there's no way that's going to happen. Uh, but it, it's the case. In Illinois, we have mandatory minimum sentences in traffic offenses. There are traffic offenses where you must go to jail. It's absurd. When I've talked to uh, low-level uh, prosecutors that I was coming here today, and I said about a mandatory minimum reform, they would say, the traffic prosecutors would say, yeah, that, that would help us. The problem with mandatory minimums, in my mind, kind of correlates with this new book out, The Rise of the Robots. Because we have judges elected and appointed who I believe do their very best to try to do the right thing at sentencing. 
Right now, the, the judges are talking about evidence-based practices in sentencing. And that's glad to hear. And when I get one aside and at, at a cocktail party can talk, I always say, well, what were you doing before? <laughs> What, what were you doing before? What, what was it based on? I believe that sentencing is the time where the mask is taken off of themes, the statute of justice, and you look at who is going to be sentences, sentenced and see what's best, not just for them, but for society. I have quoted it in sentencing hearings time and time again that the goal of the Illinois Department of Corrections and the sentencing guidelines is to reform the offender to useful citizenship. And it, it, a lot of judges take the time to really think about it and I have heard more than one time, you know, if it was up to me, uh, Mr. Kamek, I wouldn't impose the six-year sentence or the nine-year sentence or the three-year sentence or the four. But we have that mandatory minimum we have to deal with, and the prosecutor isn't going to give you a reducer on this one, and I'm not allowed to shove it down his throat. And then, at times, you have to explain to the family, well, the judge would like to provide a, a, a lighter sentence. The judge is on board. He sees what you've done. He sees what the family's done. But there's no choice. I had a gentleman in my office the other day and his mom, in a very minor uh, traffic offense with a mandatory minimum. And she said, I bet he's the first Eagle Scout you represented. And I said, as a matter of fact, no, he's not. I've got a client right now that's working on the amphetamine, methamphetamine merit badge. And it's not working out well for him. <laughs> first offense, first offense, and the prosecutor <coughs> says he's looking at six. Unless he wants to work, oh, I can imagine the kind of work, uh, undercover work, a cooperative witness that the Eagle Scout's going to do. I, I'm not sure that's going to work out right. When I was asked to be part of this, so what do you think about sentencing reform? I said, about time. I remember, on behalf of the Bar Association of Illinois, coming to Springfield when we started Truth in Sentencing. And at, I testified for the Bar Association at that hearing. And the first thing I asked was, what's the position of the Department of Corrections? Uh, they're not allowed to provide one at this hearing. Okay. And so I said, because at the time, if you got a six-year sentence, you got day for day when there was no truth depending on the sentence. I said, I made the uh, suggestion that if the prosecutor was doing his job, everybody leaving the courtroom knows what the sentence is going to be. Because the prosecutor said, you know, it says six, but they give him day-to-day -day good time so that he behaves in the Department of Corrections. You need sometimes to give somebody an incentive to behave. And the response from some of the members at the time was, you know, I really want to take objection to what that member said about uh, the state's attorney of Cook County. It had nothing to do with what was said. We have to address this because you cannot build your way out of a prison mess. There's, we already have too many prisons in Illinois. We're at 150% capacity. How many more can you build? It can't be done. We need this reform, and I thank you for doing it. Thank you so much, David. I should say I'm from Texas, and uh, my previous position was at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I am very proud uh, of the work that Texas has done in criminal justice reform. And I would say to Illinois and every other state in the country, if Texas can do it, which is the ultimate tough on crime state, any state in America can do it, there's no question. Our final speaker tonight is going to be Todd Belcor, of the community just who is the community justice lead attorney at the Shriver Center. Excuse me. Belcourt is a staff attorney focusing on litigating, organizing, and educating, uh, excuse me, educating and crafting legislation. I'm stumbling over it's my too words, Todd. <laughs> no, no, no. To help ensure that former offenders are not unjustly denied employment or occupational licenses, Todd's also a graduate of Northwestern University School of Law, where he served as president of the Student Public Service Organization and later as president of Northwestern University Student Bar Association. In recognition of Todd's commitment to public interest issues, Todd received the 2009 P.S. Law Net Pro Bono Publico Award. Belcor also received the Northwestern University School of Law's Wigmore Key Award. Todd Belcor. All right, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Good evening, everyone. My name is Todd Belcor, as was mentioned. I work at a place called the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law. And what we do is try to carry on Sergeant Shriver's legacy since 1967 by fighting against poverty through representing people in court, but also making sure people's voices are heard in the halls of Springfield and many other capitals across the nation. And as everyone's mentioned, this criminal justice issue is a significant issue. It's affecting everyone, no matter what color, class, or creed, and that Illinois is no exception to that. Uh, you heard Advisor Gaddy mention that we spend over $1.2 billion, with a B, in mm -hmm. Illinois, year after year, a blank check on an ineffective system. Uh, that's something, it's not just ineffective, it devastates individuals, it cripples families, it strips people of the opportunity to access the American dream. 
So I think in order to fix that, in order to actually do something differently, we need to radically shift the paradigm and the lens with which we use to discuss criminal justice. We actually need a turnaround, as so to speak, if you would. So what that requires is really redefining and reframing how we discuss it. Soft on crime is not having a nuanced discussion about making sure people with drug addictions go to drug courts. Soft on crime is making the easy decisions that do nothing to improve and reduce crime. Soft on crime means making more mandatory minimums. Soft on crime means making the easy decisions, making sure families are ripped apart and people never have an opportunity to be reintegrated. That is soft on crime. What's tough on crime is the tough decisions it takes to actually reduce crime. Things like removing mandatory minimums, things like making sure people have access to the resources they need to overcome these barriers to employment, and more importantly, providing the level of opportunity needed, saturate opportunity in these opportunity desert neighborhoods that are devoid of such opportunity that led, leads to such a high crime rate, that leads to poverty, so we can stop crime before it even happens. Certainly we can keep people from going to prison if we worry about the sentencing. Certainly we can make sure we help people from returning by providing them access to opportunity. But the best way is to make sure that everyone truly has access to the American dream. That means people have the tools to succeed before they even get exposed to the criminal justice system. And that's something that we work on at the Shriver Center by multiple means. Certainly in Chicago, guns are an issue. The enhancement is an issue. Uh, mandatory minimums, all those things are things we fight. But we also fight to make sure people have access to everyday necessities like employment, housing, health care, and right now there are laws over 344 in the books in Illinois that explicitly deprive access to those basic necessities for people who make past mistakes. 344 laws saying no matter what you do for the rest of your life, no matter how you've come to God, how many, how many kids you've had, no matter what you've done for your family or community, you will never be able to do certain things. And that's, that's un-American as anything I can think of. So I'm happy to be here as part of this conversation and hopefully we can have a productive one and let it lead to some real reform. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Todd. I, I really like how you're trying to reseize that uh, tough on crime label. I mean, I think that it's folks like us who are tough on crime. I've always kind of felt like, you know, it's soft on crime to tell people, here, just sit in this box and hang out for a little while. It's tough on crime to say, we're going to make sure that if you have a drug problem, you're going to get treatment. We're going to make sure that if you have victims, you're going to hold a job so that you can pay restitution to them. We're going to make sure that you take care of your kids. You actually hold people accountable. That's tough on crime. So. I think that the reformers should, should embrace that label and say, we're the tough on crime folks. Um, but let us now turn to Q&A. I think there's a, a microphone. The CKI team probably has got a mic that'll, that'll be going around. Well, you don't have to rush too much, because I was going to actually, as the moderator, go ahead and just <laughs> ask the first question myself. I'm a pushy moderator. This is a big question that I've always had about Illinois. I read that, oh, actually, I should put it this way. When I do panels like this, the first question I always get is about private prisons. People say, well, what's the role of private prisons uh, in, this, in this problem? And yet, I often hear that public sector prison guard unions are maybe even more so the problem. I've heard that in California, for example, uh, the three strikes you're out law that was uh, passed back in 1994, which is really counterproductive, that you know, prison guard unions in California are actually testifying in favor of this mandatory minimum. And I have heard that you have a, a similar problem in Illinois. Is that true? What is the role of the, of the unions here in Illinois? Can you guys speak to that? I knew there was a reason I was on this panel. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I wouldn't say unions are the culprit. I think one of the issues, and it's very significant to make sure we get this right, is that we provide folks with a task that is constitutionally required to provide certain things, uh, food, shelter for those who are imprisoned. But we don't provide them with enough resources to adequately staff them to do the things that we know will reduce crime down the line. So there's a waiting list for GED programs. There's a waiting list for certifications programs. There's a waiting list for every single program you can visualize that will give people the very tools we need to ensure that they won't commit another crime. So I think our people who are, are staffed with being, you know, keeping our folks secure who are in prisons or otherwise are working their butts off every day. I think part of the issue is uh, we may not be providing with the support that they're asking for to actually correct the underlying behavior that leads to criminal uh, activity. Yeah, just real quick on, on, on that note, I, I think too it's a leadership issue. I, I think we're going to redefine the mission statement for uh, corrections in the United States. I mean, public safety is a concern, um, but I, I think, you know, um, Harold Clark, who's the um, DOC director out of the state of Virginia, he always says, 
um, reentry begins at arrest. And I had to, I, I was in Singapore a couple years ago and I visited their, their, their Department of Corrections and their, their mission statement is the captain of men's lives. And I think here in the United States, we, we, ha we have a tendency of thinking our, the, the role of the, of the criminal justice system is to, to, to protect everybody outside of that uh, little bubble. But, uh, but prisons are part of the community and 95% of the people who are in prison are gonna come out. And so the question remains, who do we want to come out, and what is the role of government in making sure that we do create good citizens? What are we actually doing? What are we spending our tax dollars on for paying salaries and pensions? And so I think we just need to start holding uh, you know, the same accountability, like Bacrant said, in other areas of government to the criminal justice system. And I think a way to do that is to really change the mission statement um, of our criminal justice system. And I'd add that at the federal level, at, the, at least, the largest correctional association in the country, the largest union of, of correctional guards, has endorsed a bill uh, that was sponsored by Rand Paul and Ted Cruz and Mike Lee, the Smarter Sentencing Act, which would reduce mandatory minimums, uh, cut some of them in half, and, and, and is the whole entire premise is to cut incarceration at the federal level. And the reason is they don't want to go to work in overcrowded prisons that are dangerous, right? I mean. They say this is not good for our workers. So they look at it and they say, well, we need to reduce our prison population. One way to do it is the Smarter Sentencing Act. So they've endorsed it. At the same time, I, I know at the state level, sometimes correction unions will oppose these sorts of efforts because they end up closing prisons. And it's bad to, because they, they cut jobs. So part of it is, is how you frame what a prison is for. Is it an economic opportunity for a rural area? Or is it to incapacitate violent offenders who can't get along in civil society? And too often we think it's the former rather than the latter, and it should be the latter always. So we have to strike that balance between what we have prisons for and who we're putting in there to, to protect society on the one hand, but also to protect the people who are uh, housed with taking care of them inside. And I think that's, that balance is why the American Correctional Association has endorsed the Smarter Sentencing Act. That's interesting. You, you know, Vikram, as we're talking about this, we're talking about uh, this prison and that prison, and, and it occurred to me that originally we called these things penitentiaries. And you went there to be penitent, to, get, to consider your crime and how you reaffirm. And of course, back when this started, they locked them up alone and they went crazy and they realized there was no plus. And some, some time along the way, we called them a Department of Corrections. And I said, what are we correcting? Because if you're trying to correct behavior, if you're trying to correct some problem with a, a, a mental health issue or a drug issue, you're not going to do it by essentially warehousing these people for a fixed amount of time and then shooting them out the back door and saying, best of luck to you. But then that's what we're doing in so many states and to a certain ex extent in LA today. I know parole officers would really like to find help and all that, but in our tough on crime stance, parole officers have become co-workers with law enforcement in order to utilize their powers to obtain new arrests and uh, create new offenders. That's interesting. Um, yeah, let's, let's turn to questions in the crowd. We have one right up front over here. Yeah, I have about uh, 50 or 60 of them. <laughs> let's, let's start with one, 50 or 60? <laughs> the first one is, uh, why can't, uh, since 1993, every single courtroom in the state of Illinois uh, for Illinois minimum courtroom standard, 3.7, the states in there shall be equipped with audio recording devices to record the proceedings. Maybe we should start there. I don't know why <coughs> it appears that the Illinois Supreme Court said that all judges and legislators and everybody else has to follow the rules. This is a mandatory requirement. It is not permissive. That's according to their notes. We have uh, court system over here in Sangamon County, I've asked for the recusal of the entire Seventh Circuit for cause. The entire Fourth District Appellate Court panel for cause. The uh, Sangamon County State's Attorney all the way up to the Illinois Appellate Prosecutor for cause. I haven't put in one for the, appell uh, the public defender, but I, uh, I can for cause. Well, can I ask you not to, not to do that one because the private bar, we're trying to do as much as we can. So please don't eliminate the public defenders because <laughs> well, we need all, all the help. Because they're not doing their job. Yeah, they, could, could I address? Less a, and in fact, I don't know why it's not, in, it can't be considered less than effective assistance of counsel.
Council from the entire Illinois State Bar Association not to ensure that there's an accurate record. That means that you or I can't go into court of, root, uh, of law, talk to a judge, have ex parte communications at an ex parte hearing, and the other party, me for in this instance, never will find out, never can find out what was exactly presented in a co alleged court of law, and this has been going on <clears throat> now for three years. Well, I, I got a couple of words. Let me, let me go back to the first part. Um, unfortunately, the budget in Illinois has not provided a, a, the money to fully fund probation okay. for 20 years. Probation is the first line of defense, if you will, against avoiding somebody going to prison. And I, I have to tell you, in the criminal courts I practice in, every one of them, there's either a live stenographer or it's recorded. Now, I'm talking about felony courts. That, that's not necessarily in all the misdemeanor courts, but again, this is something that costs a whole lot of money. And we're talking about a fixed amount of resources. I, I find myself almost embarrassed defending the prosecutors, but they're doing the best they can with the resources they have, and so are the judges. They had $12 million that just destroyed the Illinois Supreme Court building with not a year ago. And I don't find it a cost effective uh, whatsoever when it comes to justice. It is an invalid argument you're talking about the fairness in a court of law, especially when certain under color of law, federal tradition, or under color of religion, there are certain religions that can lie in a court of law for their religious beliefs to protect that institution. Well, it, David, it, it prevents it, anybody it, and it keeps everybody honest. Does it or does it not? I'm not sure that was a question, but I'll, sure do, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to say that I believe everybody in the system is doing the very best they can to protect the rights of everybody walking in. I, I, unfortunately, I'm the only one up here that walks in and out of a courtroom usually five days a week, once or twice a day. I assure you that if I saw, or the, the, the folks I work with saw the kind of miscarriage of justice you're talking about, we would act upon it. We would. Well, we had a lot of hands up, so let's, let's go to another questioner. Yes, I'd like to know. Uh, could you, let's bring a microphone. We're recording this, so I want to make sure. Out of the, the 30,000 people, on? Oh, out of the 30,000 people arrested, uh, how many are violent, how many are nonviolent? Isn't that significant? I mean, you don't want the violent people that are killing and hurting people and robbing the old uh, elderly and stuff like that. I mean, what is the breakdown here? Well, everybody, I hear people talk about marijuana, ounce of marijuana. That, that's an old, antiquated argument you know, arresting people, let's get those people out. Well, you're shaking your head, no, what do you think? I'm saying people are still getting arrested for misdemeanor amounts of, of, of for cannabis, for, for possession of cannabis. Well, in other states, it's, you can oh. go buy it, I mean. We're in Illinois, my friend. We're, we're, <laughs> this, this is the ballpark I play in, and, and we're dealing with mandatory minimums and fines and all that. A pipe, the minimum fine is a $750 fine. And for some people, sir, $750 is a month's rent, and they need that money. They really do. And to your question about the actual percentage of people who tend to be violent or otherwise, 70% are to be nonviolent. 70% 70% of the people arrested in Cook County are for nonviolent offenses. Non and that, I, I'd add that... Those I'll, are the people that really don't need to be locked up. This is... This is exactly the point. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I mean, it is, right? But this is exactly the point. It's... it's My charge was for armed robbery. For armed robbery. Yep. Okay. Well, I take my head off to you because you're straightening yourself out. You know, so. Look, you know, you just did something about half the people in this country won't do. What's That's that? right. Take your hat off to somebody That's who true. served their sentence well, and has reformed and moved on. There are tens of thousands like him. And I take That's my right. head off to you too, sir. That's right. Uh, and I'll say that the, the distinction between violent and nonviolent is, is an important one. And the, the whole point of this is to design a system that minimizes the mistakes that are inherent to any sentencing scheme. You're going to have people who are sentenced to too much time and people who are sentenced to too little time. Right. And, and there are costs associated with each of those. And the, the point is to design a system that minimizes the mistakes, to try to get as much information as, as an input into sentencing as possible, which is why our position is that a disinterested party, in this case a judge, who knows all of the relevant circumstances of the crime, the offender, the victim if there is any, 
can look in, at the circumstances and say, okay, this sentence is appropriate for you and it's appropriate for public safety. Because if you take, it's, it's just, look, who should make the decision? The person with more information or less? The person closer to the problem or farther away? Right? The person with a stake in the outcome or a disinterested person? And in all those, those questions, the answer should be the person with more information, closer to the problem, a disinterested person. That's how we get closest to the best possible sentence for, for any given offender. Well, it's never going to be perfect, well, but we can minimize the mistakes. Yeah, let's move on to more questioners. Is the woman in the third row with her hand up over there? Dina Rasmussen, I'm with the executive vice. I'm the executive vice president of the Illinois Policy Institute. I am a Springfield resident, as are many people in the room. So thank you for coming uh, many miles from your homes to join us this evening. You all came on a really good day because even as we talk about Illinois being a state that often is in the news for not getting uh, big reforms uh, passed, a bill actually went to the governor today that took aim at one of the 344 laws that you mentioned, Todd, about helping felons via re-entry uh, get good jobs. And I would just love to hear you, Todd, flesh out what some of those 344 laws are. I personally was shocked to learn that if you come out of the prison system, uh, getting a barber license in mm -hmm. Illinois is actually one of the paths that is closed to you. When you think that you know a barber job should be one of the first places someone could look, maybe a skill that you could pick up in prison. So just help us understand a little bit more the barriers that are in place in Illinois that really, quite frankly, defy common sense. Yes, I certainly don't mean to make light of the significant progress that Illinois has made. In fact, in many ways, Illinois is at the vanguard as relates to uh, remedies like sealing, which is a very distinct remedy that allows people to petition their local courts to examine their old conviction history, and if it's an eligible conviction, to limit who can look at that old conviction to law enforcement and other entities that are given that authority by law. So what that does overnight, it allows people to pursue job opportunities and housing opportunities as someone who has no conviction history at all. So if the judge sees fit, the very same judge that says, Todd, I'm sentencing you to two years, uh, four years have passed so to complete my sentence, and I present myself to the judge, the judge can say, you know what, you've earned the opportunity, great job, now you shouldn't be discriminated against because of this old record. And since I understand that happens, I'll limit who can look at this old record to law enforcement. So there was a uh, bill that was actually passed, SB 844 out of the House, which lowers the waiting period for people trying to seek that remedy from four years to three years. But the one I think you're sp speaking to specifically is S um, HB 494, which right now what happens in general practice, people who may have an old retail theft conviction or forgery conviction can get access to employment in the schools. They can get licensure, they can um, serve as janitors, they can volunteer at the schools. But if you have a drug conviction, for the rest of your life you will never be able to be a part of that school. And what that means for families, especially in communities like Chicago, where I'm from, the southwest, south side and the west sides, that means the families, that the parents that teachers know, they love, they see them interacting with students in, in, in formal scenes. They would love for them to be more involved, to, to coach teams, be assistants. They will never have that opportunity. And to think of what that means to that child, to say, you know, their buddy says, well, why isn't your father here? Why isn't your mother here? Oh, because they, they made a mistake 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Or why, or as a child, you know, you want your parent to be there and they just can't. So what this bill would do uh, is allow schools to make that decision. Give them the discretion, the local control, to look at particular applicants, given the circumstances, the arrest report, the facts of the underlying case, and make a decision whether or not that person's a risk to the students that they'd be mm -hmm. having access to. And it's a wonderful thing, and uh, there's some representatives and senators here who have voted in favor. I don't want to put anyone on the record per se, <laughs> but I appreciate your support. It means a lot. There's a lot of parents who are here personally today who are crying as a result. Because now they can do something that the government told them they'd never be able to do, and that's be more involved in their children's life, and that's wrong. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we have real, real quick, yeah, Jesse, I'm you know, um, collateral consequences <laughs> is really the law of diminishing returns. Just what Vikrant mentioned before, we punish too much, we're actually going to reach the point that we're getting negative uh, return. And so I, I worked in reentry for a couple of years, and I, I, had, I managed about 100 men coming out of prison, including myself. I was walking out of prison myself, but I wanted to try to help these men achieve the American dream, because unfortunately, criminal justice is becoming part of the American experience. In order to achieve the American dream, you have to, you have to learn how to overcome uh, the American criminal justice system. And so as I watch men come out and we, and we say, hey, dream dreams, you know, pursue um, a job and, and, and be a good citizen, be a good father. I watched them as they walked out. They were hopeful, full of hope, energy. They were rejuvenated. Um, they had been reconciled. Um, and, they, and they were coming out with a vision of, of a new future. 
And it wasn't that most of the men that I worked with did not end up back in prison. But most of them were swallowed up by this second prison that we have in the United States. This prison that doesn't have these tangible bars, but that holds people in the margins and doesn't allow people to give back at their highest potential. We as the American people, we are founded on this concept of hard work and getting paid what's due after that hard work. But unfortunately, we throw men and women away every single day. We don't even look at individuals uh, to say, perhaps this is the best person for the job. Some of the most intelligent people I've ever met are still in prison today. Or they were released from prison and, are, and, and uh, have, have been tasked to menial labor. But they're brilliant. And I think as we as an American people have to say, you know what, we have got to say, as the gavel comes down on sentence, we have to have the same gavel in our culture that says the price is paid, it's done. Because I can tell you, every time I try to go somewhere, whether it's a professional licensing or whether it's a job interview, everybody wants their pound of flesh. And I only, have, I'm all, I only weigh so much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can really only get so much out of me. And so many times I would watch these men slowly just settle. They would just settle. And I don't know what they could have become. Actually, I do know. But it's, just, it's, it's a sad state of affairs to watch, to watch a grown man give up. Uh, how about right here in the orange tie? Thank you all for being here today. I'd also love to hear what the, uh, the Koch Foundation and also the Koch companies are doing. Um, my, my background is uh, as a law enforcement instructor who served some time in the military. Ended up as a volunteer chaplain over here in uh, Decatur. And I sat with a gentleman the other day in the ER. And, uh, and he looked like a really tough guy, you know, the guy that you wouldn't mess with, with the gold teeth and the chains and everything. And his hand was bit by his pit bull. That's why he's in the ER. And I came in there, and he broke down, and he started crying with me after we got to talking. He said, you know, nobody's ever had the, the compassion to, to care about me, to ask me what my plans were, to ask me, you know, what I could do. And, and I've been a felon, and I've made some mistakes with drugs and uh, with having a gun on me. But really, the only thing I ever wanted was going to a bus stop and taking care of the kids because they don't have the shelter at the same bus stop that I was at. They're rained on. They're cold. I see them out there when I drive by. And all I've ever wanted to do is create a business and, and do something to just get by enough that you know maybe the kids could buy some candy or whatever. Um, but I want to know what you guys think about entrepreneurship in this country and how that could be an, an alternative. Because there's a lot of, oh, let's prevent uh, the crime. I believe in prevention, of course. Um, but there's a lot of this uh, when they're in prison, let's talk about don't do this. And if you always focus like, hey, don't blink, well, you just blink. Um, you know, why not give them something else to think about? Like, do this over here. And many of the people that we see with these marijuana charges, like the gentleman earlier was talking about, they're in there because they just wanted to sell something, right? There, there's that entrepreneurial bug. What if we could use that in the right direction? Sure. You yeah. know, allow the yeah. Illinois yeah. Policy Institute to create some better entrepreneurs for us here. Yeah, I, I think um, you're exactly right. And to be quite honest, some of the most successful people I, I know walking out of prison are entrepreneurs. Um, there's a great program out of Texas, actually, called the, yeah. prison, the Prisoner Entrepreneurship Program, um, where they uh, create a mentorship for business owner and uh, allow people to create business plans. And they actually follow them through when they get out, try to get funding. And there's some great stories out, out of that. And I think it's a great model for us to take a look at as far as the um, just the economic engines that are inside of our prisons. People, um, and to be honest, quite honest, it's the easiest path. It's a hard path. Anybody knows to start a small business is, 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 is a tough road to hoe. But for men walking out of prison and women walking out of prison, I mean, it is literally the only option. You know, I, I say it all the time. We spend a billion dollars in rehabilitation in this country. It's like we tell people, hey, here's how you build a new car. Here, here are the parts. Here's the key. And we open the door, and there's no road. There's not a road to go. But with entrepreneurship, it, it does, it helps build that road, and I couldn't agree more. We were at the, an ALEC meeting a couple of years ago. I think you guys were both there as well. And uh, there was a man there who gave a presentation on starting a, an entrepreneurship uh, program in, in prison. It was a fascinating presentation. He had all this data about uh, the studies that had been done on prisoners and, and, how they, and their aptitude for entrepreneurship. And it was just off the charts for a huge percentage of these folks who were behind bars well above the national average in a lot of cases. And so they had these pilot programs, and it, and it was worked out to where if there were savings on recidivism, these guys got something on the back end, savings for the state, gave them an incentive to do it. 
And they had hundreds of people go through this program, and the recidivism rate was virtually zero for these folks who went through the program, learned these learn how to take their, their entrepreneurial instincts, but channel them into productive things instead of you know, running a drug empire or something like that. But you know, the, the entrepreneurial instincts are there, the skills are there, it's just changing the culture, changing the behavior, and channeling those things into, into productive activities, keeping them out of the life of crime and into something that's actually useful. And, and again, the, the evidence is that those sorts of programs dramatically reduce recidivism. It gives them something to focus on, something to learn, something to, to strive for when they get out. And these are folks who get out and start businesses. They hire people. You know, we have a, a, a woman who's a fam person. She was uh, given a commutation on a drug, a life drug sentence. I think it was President Clinton who commuted her sentence. And she started a, an RV company down in Texas. She's got 100 employees now, something around there. Just a, a tremendously successful business. She'd still be in prison, but for the commutation. It's not an isolated case. Like Chester, they're everywhere. You just have to be able to tap into that potential. But if you lock them up for the rest of their lives, you, you lose that forever. And you lose a human being forever. That's important to remember, I think. There's two things I'd like to add to that very briefly. Not only is it important to make sure you're building upon anyone's existing interests while they're incarcerated, while you have a captive audience, an opportunity to train and really hone skills, but I think it's even more important to eliminate these lifetime bars to licensure. A lot of these jobs, a lot of these entrepreneurial endeavors require a license. And if you can right. never access it, it doesn't matter what you do. I mean, there's a whole story about how we're teaching people how to cut hair in prison, mm -hmm. only so far as once they get out of prison, it, they're legally barred from accessing the licensure necessary to practice that art. Uh, we need to seriously assess these lifetime bars, just like we do with these mandatory minimums, to ensure that the people who are closest to these decisions, just like judges, the licensing boards, the people who have the the best information available to determine someone's character and whether they turn their lives around, whether they're risk to the public, let them make those decisions to determine who's best to lead the, you know, the next generation of people who are building businesses and making our country better. You had a question about Coke's work. Why don't we talk about it afterwards? There's so many questions I want to get to people, but it, let's talk afterwards. Uh, how about right here in the blue shirt, third row? Thank you. Um, all right, sorry. Um, my name is Maria. I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for this panel. This is very eye-opening, and understanding like this is happening across the country is really encouraging and empowering. Um, so I'm from. I work with Voices of Youth in Chicago Education, and we also work in campaign for common sense discipline. I hear you all talk a lot about front-end solutions, um, and I think that's great. Actually, our bill just passed the, the House floor today um, that limits the use of expulsions and suspensions in schools because. Research has shown that if you get suspended or expelled, you're three times more likely to get in contact with the juvenile justice system. Um, so talking in talking about front end solutions, um, what are the other examples other than the mandatory minimums and ending those? Um, what are other community-based or evidence-based solutions that you've seen across the country that you think is either interesting or you think might work for Illinois? Well, no, go ahead. No shortage of ideas. I mean, for every four dollars or five dollars invested in education while incarcerated, um, every dollar you would get four dollars return. So making sure that maybe there's a mandatory GD process for people serving a year or longer, um, increasing access to good time, increasing access in the number of, of problem-solving courts. So don't send someone to, as uh, Councilor Kemick said, uh, a warehouse, a, a cage, to, to help them overcome their drug addiction. Actually give them the counseling that they need and in a community setting such that it's supportive and they can see them through so they can overcome the underlying issue that led to the criminal behavior. Um, these are things that are being done better in places like Georgia, being done better in places like Kentucky. Um, in Indiana, they have a 10% lower recidivism rate than we do. Uh, there's definitely steps that we can take and all those are things we're working towards. But I think the problem is, is we're doing so in a piecemeal way. Uh, and if we continue to do it in a piecemeal way, we will see incremental change and we will be able to help people but in order to radically change the way we approach the system, uh, we need to change the way we consider how it's purpose, and that's to, to stop crime, not just to incapacitate people who make mistakes. Uh, just about, do you see a connection at all with restorative justice? I know that's um, always, that's kind of been a hot topic now, but for generate, uh, for generations, like I remember I got restorative justice when I did something bad in my family, right? When my mom would sit me down and talk to me about the things that I did. So do you guys see like restorative justice in connection to some of the solutions that you do? 
Yes, I mean, most definitely. I mean, I didn't talk about it too much, but I mean, our premise, I mean, for us to look at, if we're going to support a bill, we're going to look at, is it going to increase the restorative nature of the system? And so we really take restorative justice practices and really try to pull it up to a policy level, because most of the people that talk about restorative justice think of it in a practice way. Um, and so we really take those principles that are applied in those programs, like victim offender, offender mediation dialogue, those values that are represented in those practices and bring them up to a policy level. So if we're going to look at the victim, we're going to say, well, you know, are victims being represented fully? Are, are, are they being validated? Um, do they have a proper voice? I mean, for the responsible party, is there a closure? Is, it the, is, the, is the punishment proportionate? And for the community, you know, um, uh, is public safety being advanced? Uh, these types of values that are associated with each one of the main stakeholders in the system. Um, but I will say just real quick on the trends across the street, as, as, across the country as far as front end reforms, I mean, I think one of the strongest things we see and what Illinois has just done is creating the commission. Because really you have to start to take a look and say, well, who is entering the front door? And if we don't know who's entering the front door, then we don't really know how to fix it. And what I mean by that is, in some states, they, they determined that up to a third of people who were entering the door were from um, probation violations or technical revocations, which means people being revoked for not even committing a new crime, but they're being revoked for probation. They could go back to prison for a year or more or go to prison in the first place. Same on the parole side, on the back end. So people who have already been to prison are getting out. Are we sending them back in for minor violations? And so one of the greatest or one of the most innovative, I believe, um, policy reforms that's happened across the country is what's been called Swift and Certain Sanctions, which was developed out of a uh, program called HOPE in Hawaii, in which, which basically is quite simple. You, you mentioned you use restorative justice with your children. This is very simple or very similar to that in the sense of a person's going to sign up and they're going to say, okay, you're going to take a drug test every day or whatever it is, like your certain color comes up. If I'm red and red comes up on Wednesday, I have to, I have to you know, do a urine analysis. And if I, if I drop dirty, then I know that I immediately I'm going to have a sanction, immediately. And in some states, they've actually um, been able to allow the probation officer or the parole officer to administer those sanctions so that it doesn't have, you don't have to wait to go to the judge, you don't have to sit on the docket, you get immediate. And what I find fascinating with this is they interviewed individuals who went through the status quo system, which, which is very arbitrary, which means... A person could do the same behavior, that's re uh, the same revocable behavior up to five times, and they would never be revoked. But as soon as they got revoked, they would say, well, I know John Doe, and he did it eight times. This is unfair. But people that went through the swift and certain sanctions model, and they finally, they, they, they had to work hard, but they got back into the system, they would all say, it's my fault. And I'm a firm believer that that in, in and of itself is of value when people are reflecting inwardly and saying this is my fault and not pointing the finger outwardly. If, if I could, you know, El Illinois does have uh, intermediate sanctions through probation, so, so we've taken that step. Um, and, and it's meetings like this and forums like this that give us an opportunity to say this is what else needs to be done. Um, we really need to make sure that probation is fully funded so that we can prevent people from going to prison. Uh, I can remember talking about these mandatory minimums. I can still see it in my mind's eye, meeting with the dad and his son, and I was explaining to him, though in this case, there's a mandatory minimum ses uh, sentence, and he was from a, a, a very upper middle class community, and the dad says, well, that wasn't meant for people like us, was it? <laughs> and I true. said, unfortunately, yes, yes sir, it, yeah. it applies to everyone, and he was, he was shocked, and I said, until this moment, you were a conservative, weren't you? <laughs> and, and, and he chuckled and he paused, but the point was made. Um, I, I'm asking about the mandatory minimum. I said, that's proof that there's a reaction to the knee jerk because it's the easy thing to do. Yeah. And every, every person on this panel and, and the uh, Illinois Policy Institute is saying, hey, let's, let's not let the knee jerk and do the easy thing anymore. And the work you guys are doing across the country is just extraordinary. Do we have time for more questions? One more. One more. Okay. Uh, right here in the pink, I guess about four hours back. Yeah. Hi. Um, I think the elephant in the room that has not been discussed yet is the fact that the majority of folks incarcerated are black males. Mm -hmm. And I would like to hear your opinion about the racist policies and laws that are in our country that continue to increase black male incarceration. What's that doing to the, to the black community? 
And when we talk about doors being shut when people come out of prison because of their past, that door is shut 10 times more because of the person's color. Yeah, that's uncomfortable for me, but let me make sure I respond to that because it's important. I, I have direct experience with it, but our Cook County president, Tony Preckwinkle, has a story that she likes to relay. I think, I think it's important to share in this context. A delegation from South Africa came, and they went to see the, the courts at 26 in California in our jails. And after a day of touring and you know, whining and dining, they asked, great, we've seen the jail for black people. Where are the jail for others? What that means is the most trafficked, the most large, the, the most frequented court in the nation is only seen as one that's published, um, punishing people of color. And that's because there's a disproportionate contact of people of color with law enforcement. I went to school at the University of Michigan. Now, I maintain, I've been living in the South Side. I, my mother is in the South Shore community. And I saw more criminal activity happen at white frat parties than I'll ever see on the South Side of Chicago. Fights, drug abuse, rape, all those things, awful things, never reported. If it is reported, never followed up. If it is followed up on, no charges are brought. If charges are brought, they're able to pay a high priced lawyer to get them out. And that's the sort of justice that other people see and say, well, that's unfair. So that creates a source, that same sort of dichotomy. It's where you see that's, that's happening for them down the way, so maybe I won't be held accountable when I do the same sort of behavior. But that's not the way it works. Uh, that's just not the way it works. And people of color get caught up in the law enforcement and they get convicted disproportionately for the same crimes as data-driven, data shown. Um, so to do something about that, we need to make sure that we have policing that's, that's fair in all places. So people know that the justice system works for them and everyone else. But also, just as importantly, I think it's important that people know that opportunities should be equally distributed too. So they don't say, well, you give me no schools, you give me no jobs, and you give me nothing but police officers watching my adolescent behavior and you're surprised that I'm incarcerated. I think there's something we can do better to solve that sort of conundrum. And I think that's an issue that's gonna to continue to happen and be replicated until we take action and do something about it. Yeah, additionally too, I, I think, you know, for me, when I, I grew up middle class, um, I walked into the criminal justice system and, you know, uh, the first thing that struck me um, was that I was middle class. Um, and that I was viewed as wealthy and I wasn't wealthy. Um, you know, and there's a, a great story out of Georgia of, of, of a young man, young African-American man, who got a deferred uh, sentence if he, if he could show up to this program. He, he, was in, he, he was in jail, the judge gave him this deferred sentence, he, ha he would have to show up to this program, but in order for him to show up to the program, he had to post bail. But he can't, he can't post bond, so he can't go to the program. So he ends up going into the system. And so, you know, reinvigorating, uh, you know, uh, bolstering indigent defense, making sure that everybody's on equal playing field when we first start is, is, is key. Um, yeah. Well, let, there, let, let me add one thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry please. I, I think sometimes it's important to distinguish between racist intent and, and racial disparity outcomes. A lot of times those two things are conflated in, in popular discourse. And the idea is that if you see a racial disparity uh, impact, people infer a racist intent. And, and I, I think that that's, that's bad analysis. And one example I would cite is uh, school zone laws, right? Uh, most states have some sort of enhancement for drug offenses that are committed within some number of feet of schools. The intent is obvious, right? Kids are near schools, kids are near parks. We want to deter drug activity near those places. So we're going to enhance the penalties in the hope that that will deter drug activity near those, those places. And you know, it's 1,000 feet, 1,500 feet. Uh, fortunately, they've been narrowed in most states in recent years. But there, there's nothing racist in the intent of that law. But the, the impact is such that just given where different communities live, Minorities are impacted considerably more often by those laws than, than white citizens. In Florida, nearly 90% of new, we call them drug-free zones in Florida, prison commitments were black defendants. Whites were more likely to get some sort of non-prison sanction. Blacks got prison at considerably higher rates. And they were just impacted by those laws at greater rates simply by virtue of the fact that that's where they lived, was within those, those school zones. So you have a, a, a totally unintended consequence that creates this 
racial disparity. But uh, it, it, a lot of times I think people say, well, it's racist that you pass that school zone law. And no, it, it shouldn't be that anybody's racist for passing that. The intentions are noble, but we shouldn't ignore the impact either because it's real. Well, I think that's where the question comes in. When you see decades of data demonstrating the impact and the failure to do something about it, then when do you start holding people accountable for failing to do something about yeah, it? Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, David, two, th two things. One, uh, Illinois has a uh, enhancement with a minimum for a crime within a school zone, and that includes if you just happen to be driving past the school and you're stopped there and possessing. You, it, the crime is just a simple possession. The enhancement kicks in if with you in a school or park. In, in, in a hopeful sign, uh, I don't always talk about it in a mixed company, but I worked my way through law school and undergrad as a police officer. So I still, to this day, have a lot of friends who are police officers. It's a weird way to say it, I, I suppose. <laughs> but I'm dealing with police officers all the time. Some of my best friends and some of my best clients have been police officers. And when I, when I was a police officer, I saw racist cops, and I saw cops do racist things, and I did everything I could to stop that or prevent that. Uh, my partner for about eight years was an African American, and uh, it wasn't always well received by some of the folks, but it didn't matter to us. But and I'm talking to police officers today, and I see a lot less of that. Yeah. I, I, more of them col uh, color blind, color neutral, and want to make sure they do the right thing for the right reason. So there is some hope in the system. There is some hope. Well, I don't think there's a better way to end a panel than hearing a defense attorney say, some of my best friends are police officers. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. let's, uh, let's end the panel, but let's not end the conversation. There's still many hands up. I encourage all of you to come up and say hello to our panelists. I want to thank our panelists, by the way, for coming here tonight. I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to thank uh, Lydia and Brianna. I think I see them in the corner. They have worked for many months on putting this event together. They worked very hard. Um, thank uh, thank you all so much. Please continue to follow the Charles Koch Institute and the work that we do in this area, and have a wonderful night. Thank you. you gave me a great closing. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, we have we to turn shut these off. Hi, how are you? Yeah. Before yeah. I say anything. Thank you so much. Yeah. Nice to meet you, John. Hey, not enough talk. Right, right, right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah.